Starting in the sandy Sonoran Desert, the Pacific Crest Overland Route stretches for almost 2,500 miles, passing through the hottest and driest parts of the US before climbing alongside the cool Sierra Nevada Mountains and incredible Cascade Mountains. Along the way, it passes dozens of unique sites, both historical and geological, including ghost towns, abandoned mines, bizarre rock formations, impressive volcanoes and lava tubes, before ending close to the Canadian border. We were there to take it on in my new Tundra, which I had just bought three weeks earlier. I had taken it out on the trails the day after buying it, and had quickly learned that it wasn't cut out for a long distance trip. The stock tires had very little tread, the long wheelbase and load clearance made obstacles a challenge, and I wanted more storage. Some modifications were in order, and I had very little time to do it. I left my truck with Heretic Studio, CBI, and Prinsu to be scanned. It was so new that nothing had been developed for it. A few weeks later, I picked it up with a fresh roof rack for storage and bed bars for my iCamper rooftop tent. Heretic put on the Tundra-specific lights they developed, and I went south to Phoenix, Arizona for the lift, wheels, and tires. It wasn't finished, but it was more than good enough for its first big trip. We are back out in the desert, and behind me, we actually got the Mexican border just over the road there. I've got Nick and Jessica in the F-150 Tremor. I've got my Tundra, which is just freshly modified. Uh, Andreas is in there with me, he just helped me air down. And we're getting ready to basically head north through the desert here, along the Pacific Crest Overland Trail. The route starts along the sandy banks of the Coachella Canal, which was bumpy and slow going due to the whoops. But Andreas and I were both excited to be back out. He's done several other trips with me, but this was the first time in California for both of us. There were a bunch of famous sites to see, including Joshua Tree, the Mojave Road, and the Trona Pinnacles. It was also the first big trip in the new truck, and I was looking forward to seeing how it did. While I was packing up the drone, I'm pretty sure I heard Andreas say that he also wanted to test it out. Use the drone and- You said you're gonna jump it. Yep, nope, nobody said that. About eight miles in, the road drops away from the canal and the smoother, soft sand of the open desert allowed us to speed up and have some fun. It's getting late, so we've got to start thinking about trying to find a place to camp. I think we're about to get onto pavement for a little bit and then it goes back off into the sand, so we might end up camping in the sand. So far today, the tundra has been fantastic. It does really well in the sand, it hasn't got bogged down at all. And uh, with the exception of some of the whoops, the lift and the tires have been great. There have been a couple of times I bottomed out. If we hit a whoop really hard, uh, I think the front ones have bottomed out, and that's on the 35s, so I can't imagine what it would have been like on 37s, which is what I originally wanted to put on here. Off Highway 78 is the Osborne Overlook. This incredible viewpoint allows you to look out over the expansive dune field, and is a mixing spot for off-road drivers and photographers who all come out here for the sunset. Found ourselves a nice little place to camp just as the sun's setting. We've got wilderness area just ahead of me, and then it's BLM here, and they've got railroad tracks right there. Apparently, it's not the most peaceful spot because trains go past all night, but okay. uh, it's beautiful. You've got mountains off in the distance, and the weather here is fantastic. It's like 75 degrees right now, no wind. I'm happy.
As we ate dinner around the propane fire pit, we noticed a couple of glowing dots in the dark just outside of camp. Bear spray. Dude, I don't have any fox spray. Fox spray. <laughs> I see the guys who just dodged the bullet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we're probably over their house, dude. He's like, um, you parked on my den? <laughs> It ended up being not such a bad spot after all. We had maybe like four or five trains go by in total. Three or four of them were overnight and they were loud, they woke us up, but it wasn't so bad since it was just three or four times. So now we're getting packed up and then we're gonna continue heading north, uh, hopefully making up to Joshua Tree tonight. From camp, it was north again along the well-maintained but very dusty road that ran parallel to the North Dune Field. I feel sorry for Jessica, she's driving behind me and it's so dusty, there's no way she can see a thing. Eventually, we reached paved roads at the Salton Sea. I'll let you lead since you know where you're going. Nick took the lead to show us some of the neat attractions in the area. The first stop was Salvation Mountain, just outside of Slab City. It's created by Mr. Leonard Knight. He was born in 1931 accepted Jesus at 36, and he didn't mess around. <laughs> the 50-foot tall mountain is constructed out of mud and straw bricks, waste car parts and tires, and an enormous amount of paint. After night passed in 2014, volunteers took over maintaining the mountain and protecting it from the harsh desert. We continued around the Salton Sea to Bombay Beach, which is famous for its rather unusual artworks. The area was originally a thriving tourist destination but environmental issues with the Salton Sea led to its decline in the 70s. Today, it attracts people to see its odd art features, such as the Bombay Beach Drive-In Movie Theatre. We just stopped for lunch and it's not stupid hot. I think it's in the 70s, but the sun is just beating down. It makes me wish I had some kind of awning. Right now, I've got like the, um, it's the CBI crossbars on here, which is not ideal for my setup. If you're gonna have those, you either need to have the long bed with the long tent or the short tent with the short bed. And obviously I've gone with a different combination here. Uh, good thing is that CBI will obviously at some point be coming out with their bed rack, the full height one. So I'm going to switch that out onto here and then the tent will overhang. But the point of saying all of this is I think I need an awning and I really want to get one of those 270 degree awnings because they look, they look cool.
and easy to set up. Tons of shade, great for eating lunch when you're somewhere like this. We briefly drove along the Coachella Canal again before cutting northeast through a series of small canyons of the Mecca Hills. Most of the canyons were wide enough for easy driving, but there was one very tight spot that definitely made me realize I was in a full-size truck now. With the help of the cameras, I made it through. Just. Oh, that was tight. We've reached the end of the sandy, rocky trail right here. You've got a highway behind me. And we're going to get on that, and I think we basically take that up to Joshua Tree, or just south of Joshua Tree, where I have a campsite marked. I don't actually remember marking this campsite, so I have no idea if it's a good one or not. But that's where we're going to head, because at least we know we can get there before dark. So, should be there around 5, I think. A lot of people camped out here. What I'm hoping is all of the RVs and everything are right here, right at the edge next yeah. to the paved road. And then as we go further in, yep. we escape them. We finally found ourselves a spot to camp right here on some BLM land just south of Joshua Tree, which starts like a hundred feet over there. It's not a bad spot. The best spot there's a little RV out there on the end. They've got the best spot because they've got great views up and down the valley, mountains in the distance. There was another spot that we found earlier on, up that way, closer to the National Park entrance. And it's down a little side road, but people had set up camp right in the middle of that side road, blocking everyone else from getting through there. And they had this little camper set up, like, completely in the middle. So we couldn't go there. But this place will do. It's not as nice, so if you come out here, there is there are better spots. So we're gonna set up, we're gonna cook dinner, and uh, I'm actually gonna help Andreas. 
because he... Hey, can, you, can you check your pockets and see if you don't have it, if he didn't grab yours, because it looks like mine. He's lost his cell phone. Yeah, not a good place to lose it, though. No. Somewhere out here. It might be in my pocket. That's what I mean. You want me to look? Yeah. That's yours. No, don't put this on tape. It's on camera. No. Where is it? Call it again. So I just called his phone and I know where it is. I don't know your truck. Might be exactly where I told him where it is. All right, Rob. You Do I have to call funny. it again? It was funny for a little bit. Oh. Okay. Amazing. And what's it connected I to? I have no idea. What's it connected to? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the charger that it was plugged into the whole time. The Pacific Crest route goes straight through Joshua Tree, but we wanted to spend a little more time exploring the park. Before we went to bed, we looked over the map and picked out a route for the next day. I forgot to show this off yesterday. Going through that canyon, there was that really narrow section. I did scrape the mirrors on there just right on the edge. And I actually could have made it through fine. All I need to do is fold in the mirrors, but of course I'm used to the forerunner size. You guys are all staring at me. It's making me feel really self-conscious. <laughs> no it's not too big of a deal. I'm sure it's the first of many scratches. I just need to be a little more careful now that I'm driving a full-size truck, especially today as we head into some of the trails of Joshua Tree. It was a short drive from our campsite down to the interstate. We took it east to the next exit and headed into Joshua Tree. We just made it up into the area of interesting rocks. So we're gonna make a bunch of stops here starting at Split Rock. Joshua Tree National Park is over a thousand square miles in area, but you won't actually see any Joshua trees until you make it through Wilson Canyon, heading into the northwest third of the park. This area also contains most of the hikes and sites, including Split Rock and Skull Rock. All right, we have just turned off pavement and we're heading up towards the Wall Street Mill. It's a short little hike up here. No idea what it's like, but I do like go and see old mines and old mills. So we'll check it out. The Wall Street Mill hike is an easy two mile round trip through the Joshua trees. Along the way are several offshoots to explore where you can visit crumbling homesteads and find old rusted out cars. The mill was built by William Keyes in 1930 to process gold ore from his mines and other nearby mines in the Mojave Desert. It operated on and off up until 1966. We are turning on to Geology Tour Road. It's not actually the same route as the Pacific Crest Overland Route that takes you out the north of the park on Old Dale Road, but I saw this on a recent uh, trail recon video and decided I wanted to give it a go. Geology Tour Road starts off well maintained, but when you reach the start of Burdu Canyon Road, things get a little rougher. National parks usually exaggerate the condition of their roads, but we decided we'd go ahead and air down.
While the road definitely wasn't as well maintained, it started off easy enough. As we descended the canyon, the trail started getting tougher. There were patches of rocky road and some tight squeezes. We spent the time picking the best lines we could for the big trucks, especially since the Tundra comes with just one tiny plastic skid plate and neither of us had rock sliders. On one particularly tight spot, I managed to scrape all four of my brand new method wheels. I know it sounds painful to scratch aftermarket wheels, but it's to be expected when taking them off-road and shows that you actually use the vehicle. I'm glad to have them too. The bead grip is fantastic for holding the bead at lower pressures. If you want a set of your own, you can get 20% off using the link in the description. Towards the end of the canyon was one final obstacle and the hardest one we'd done in either of our trucks. It was a test of flex and traction for two vehicles not really designed for wheeling. In the end, both the stock Tremor and modified Tundra were very evenly matched. The Tundra has far better traction control, but with the help of a little better suspension travel and the rear locker, the Tremor was able to get through too. So we have just made it out of the national park and out of the canyon, and that was a lot of fun. That's really, that's probably some of the toughest stuff I've done in the Tundra now, and I really enjoyed it. I definitely need to get rock sliders though, uh, especially when I do more stuff like that. Um, so now, like I say, we're out of the National Park, and I want to be really clear that the gate is just around the corner there, because I recently had someone commenting on one of my videos who was furious, saying I was flying inside the National Park, and he's going to report me to the National Park Service, and to the FAA, and, you know, all the right people. Except, like I say, I wasn't flying in the National Park. Uh, I do pay a lot of attention to these roads, where they go, whether they're inside or outside, and of course they all eventually go out of the National Park, so I wait until we're outside the National Park.
We're back on highway. Unfortunately, Nick and Jessica had to leave us. They've got to go home. Uh, Andreas and I are continuing on. We're going to keep going north. Uh, right now, we're going around Joshua Tree up to Joshua Tree, the town, uh, to try and find a place to camp that hopefully is sheltered because it is ridiculously windy. The first spot I had picked out to camp last night ended up being out in the middle of some plains just north of Joshua Tree and was really, really windy. So we decided to head a little further north and we're up here in the Mojave National Preserve now. And we saw this little road that came out and dead ended next to some hills on the map and came out here, ended up being really sheltered. So it was a great little spot. Unfortunately, you aren't allowed to fly drones here either. It's not a national park, but it is administered by the National Park Service, so no drones anywhere here. But that's okay. Got my camera, got my gimbal, got some GoPros. We'll still get some good footage as we head north further into the preserve and check out some of the sites on the Mojave Road. We had been looking forward to traveling the Mojave Road. It's one of those famous bucket list roads that's known amongst overlanders nationwide. Rather than drive along the highway straight to it, we decided to take some of the smaller, unpaved side roads. They were fun and interesting, until we turned onto one final side road that connected to the Mojave Road. It was dead straight for over 10 miles following an old set of power lines. We have just reached the Mojave Road, so we're picking up, and we're picking up about halfway along, but this is where, from here, where all the cool sights are to see, and I'm kind of relieved to be off that back road that follows those power lines. The Mojave Road is a historic route that has been used for centuries by Native Americans, explorers, settlers, and traders to cross the Mojave Desert between distant water sources. Most of the road is fairly easy, just requiring high clearance, but the terrain makes it slow going. Today, it takes about three days to complete the 150 mile route. Along the way are plenty of stops, like the Mojave mailbox. I wonder if there's any mail. Yeah, take a look. Oh, there's a book. You can sign your name. Go for it. I've got a scanty too. <laughs> oh, and a lucky car. Go on, give us a scene. You may have to edit this a little bit, make it sound better. <laughs> okay. That's so cool. Oh, this was just put in there. On Sunday. If you get hungry. If you need a mask up here. Monster truck. Here's a pen. All right, go on, sign us in. I've decided that rather than sticking my sticker to the outside of the mailbox, I'm gonna put them in the mailbox. That way, if you come up here in the next few weeks or months, or I don't know, however long, you can help yourself. As you head west from the mailbox, the terrain gets more and more volcanic. A short drive from the Mojave Road, 
surrounded by cinder cones, are some ancient lava tubes that you can climb down into. this hell. If you end up following our tracks on Patreon, then don't, or at least not exactly. As you come across the Mojave Road, there's a bit between a couple of mountains where the road's got lots of splits in it, it's very windswept, and unfortunately we made the wrong choice on one of the splits, ended up going off track, following other people's tracks, uh, end up turning around, going back to the proper Mojave Road, uh, which brings you down here to Soda Lake, the very windy Soda Lake. Uh, this is kind of a not so flat salt flat, and uh, if it has rained at all within the last few weeks, if you come out here, don't come out onto the flats because you will sink into it and get stuck. Uh, we talked to a couple that we passed a couple of hours ago and they said that it's actually fine today, but you definitely want to stick to the road because if you step off, it gets really sinky. Like I'm sinking into it, just walking on it. As you approach the end of Soda Lake, you come across Traveler's Monument. People bring rocks from all over the US to add to the pile and read the commemorative plaque that it hides. If you want to know what the plaque says, I guess you'll have to visit for yourself. A short distance further, you leave the preserve and enter the Razor OHV area. The Mojave Road is initially very easy to follow, but because it's an open riding area, there are tire tracks in every direction and it's very easy to go off course, which is exactly what we did. I'm just going the wrong way here. There you go. This is, Yo, this the, is the one I was on. The Mojave Road apparently goes through private property there, so there's like a detour that goes around it. Uh, except we <laughs> we're now backtracking going the wrong way. Yes, so I see fresh tire tracks on this one. I think this is the right road and it's a lot more substantial. So it is really easy to go the wrong direction. I see that there are cairns, there's little piles of rock on this one. So we'll follow this and we'll follow these tire tracks. Eventually, we ended up back on the route. Because we'd driven into the preserve late the previous night, I hadn't had the chance to download the offline maps on Onyx Off-Road. If I had, I would have had a nice blue line to follow. 
Onyx is a mapping app for your phone and web browser that is fantastic for finding trails. There are hundreds of thousands of miles of curated trails across the US with details on difficulty and time taken, as well as pictures and points of interest. If you've got GPX tracks like the Pacific Crest Route, they're easy to upload, or you can create your own on the Onyx website. If you want to learn more, use the link in the description and use the code REVERE for 20% off. So one of the things about going overlanding is you always need to be prepared to recover yourself, especially if you're going somewhere like this with soft sand. And the best way to do that is to go with someone else like we were earlier. Unfortunately, we're alone. So I have got myself some recovery equipment. That way we're not stranded if we get bogged down in the sand. Uh, and I actually got myself a couple of pretty cheap recovery boards, traction boards from wish.com. And they came in a few weeks back. Here they are. And you know, you might think they're a little compact, which they are, but it's great because it makes them easy to store and they're very lightweight. I actually think next time we hit a patch of soft sand, we should uh, test them out, see how they do. All right, so we buried the rear tires just a little bit here in two wheel drive. It's time to test these out. Like I said, these things are great, much better than Max Trax because they're really compact and light. Look how easily they stack together. You know, they take up no room at all. So let's test them out. Let's see how they do. Gonna put one under this tire, like that. We'll go around the other side, follow me around. Stick the other one under this tire. Just like that. And hopefully, we'll get out now. There, we're out. See, flawless, highly recommended. Of course, one of the downsides is when you're in sand like this, it can be a little harder to find traction boards. That's why you go with the bright orange ones. So they show up, you can get them easily. As we joined the beautiful Afton Canyon, Andreas climbed out of my window to get a cool shot for his Instagram reels. While he was doing it, I might have accidentally driven through a puddle. All for the gram. I won't get you back with this one though, Rob. <laughs> Just wait. Huh? Like, look what you did. Right. You got, you got look, everything wet in here. here. <laughs> or because you had to lean out the window. That video better be gold. <laughs> At the end of the Mojave Road are two final water crossings, and they are known for being deep. Thankfully, the couple we'd passed earlier in the day had told us to stick to the side closest to the bridge. This is where the water line came up to on this side. It's a pretty deep water crossing. That's like thigh high on me. Pretty deep. After the final water crossing, we reached the interstate where we needed to head west to Barstow. A quick stop to eat and I got rid of Andreas before heading out to find a place to camp. Well, 
Last night I dropped Andreas off in Barstow, which is just south of here. He got a hotel for the night because he's got a bunch of work he has to do. He's got Zoom meetings he has to attend, and he didn't really want to do that sitting in the tent. So he's in the hotel. I came up here just north of Barstow in some BLM land, found myself a little sheltered spot, and I figured I'd use the morning. I'm going to pick him up about 2 o'clock. I figured I'd use the morning to get some videos done. Uh, I've got to do a walk around of the tundra. I want to do an overview of this rooftop tent. Uh, lift kit review, uh, video on the lights I've got on the Tundra, roof rack, like a bunch of stuff I've got to get done. And so far it really hasn't stopped either raining or snowing or sleeting. And right now it's sleet. And when I got up earlier it was just very wet snow. So it's kind of unpleasant and I haven't been able to get any of that stuff done. So instead I'm just transferring video files across to my hard drive and editing pictures for Instagram. On the bright side, I did get plenty of sleep. I was able to sleep in until nine when my alarm went off, where Andreas, because he works in Eastern time, he had to wake up at 5 a.m. And that's why I chose not to stay in the hotel with him. After picking up Andreas, we headed out to see the Calico ghost town. Hello, got two adults. That's two adults? Yeah. In 1881, four prospectors came across the mountains overlooking the area and noticed their distinctive patterns, which resembled a calico coloring. In their exploration, they came across a large silver vein. Within just a few years, they were California's largest silver producer, accounting for 85% of all of California silver. Where there's a successful mine, there's money, and the town quickly grew to over 3,500 people with three hotels, five general stores, three restaurants, and a school. By 1896, the boom was over. The value of silver was down to the point where the mine was no longer economically viable. A year later, the school and businesses shut down, and by 1907, it was completely abandoned. In 1951, Calico was bought and restored as a tourist attraction, it has a very commercial vibe, and I prefer the ghost towns found in the wild, but obviously the tourism has helped maintain what you see today. The sun is back out, the wind has dropped, it's still pretty chilly, but I'm just barely comfortable in my t-shirt. And we're back out in the desert, actually pretty desolate desert, there's not a lot around us, so we're airing down, ready to follow some tracks that uh, a friend of mine called Sean sent me that basically cross the desert here to Trino Pinnacles. Unfortunately, we're close to Edwards Air Force Base and in probably one of the biggest restricted airspace chunks in the US, so no drone flying here. Any bears? No bears. They're probably out. Oh, that's it? That's it. <laughs> okay. It's a little impact, my man. Yeah. We found ourselves a pretty cool campsite up here with views over the valley, set up just as the sun's about to set. So I got my time lapse going, of course, and uh, I guess I need to make Andreas put the tent up and start cooking dinner for me. All right, after that, I want you to start cooking dinner. <laughs> me? Yes. <laughs> I'll bring you on these trips to do the work by myself. Well, you know the cooking. I do know the, the cooking. The cooking is for you. 
I do the eating. <laughs> you do the eating, I do the cooking. That is true. Although I wouldn't say I really do the cooking, especially not with that chicken alfredo thing. Yeah, that's gonna... Like, I do the heating up. There you go. We had spent the entire morning traveling through the dusty California backroads before coming out onto pavement for a short stretch and finally heading north to something we'd been talking about for days. Well, here we are, the Throne of Pinnacles. Well, what a cool little spot. Definitely worth the trip here if you're in the area. I'd imagine coming here at sunset's the best time. During golden hour, get the best pictures. 
100,000 years ago, the area surrounding the Trona Pinnacles would have been deep under a series of inland seas. Ancient springs fed hot, calcium-rich water into the carbonated lake water, which slowly combined to form huge calcium carbonate spires. Today, there are over 500 of them, some as tall as 140 feet, and they make a beautiful place to stop and take pictures, video, or camp for the night. We wouldn't be camping there, however. We had another famous location in mind. Uh, we just aired back and we're back on highway. We've got about 80 miles to go until we get to Alabama Hills. We do just barely cut through the corner of Death Valley National Park, uh, but we won't be hanging around. I know some of you are gonna think that I'm mad for skipping Death Valley, uh, but it's because we're gonna be coming back out here later this year and I want to save it for then when we've got a good few days to spend there and for when I have rock sliders and a winch or some other people with us because I really want to do Death Valley properly. Well, we finally found ourselves a place to camp, just on the north end of Alabama Hills, down by Movie Road. You're not actually allowed to camp on or around Movie Road, but down that area where you are allowed to camp, it's just full of RVs, campers, fifth wheels, vans, in every single spot. And we drove through at four o'clock. We thought we were getting there a little early. Uh, apparently, if you want to get the best spots, you need to get here even earlier than that. But we continued up this area, north end, and we've still got great views. You got the mountains there, you got the other mountains that way, can't remember the name of them. You got a time lapse going of that, showing the shadow moving up the side of those. And we're comfortable, we're gonna start cooking. And I think tonight's gonna be pretty cold, it's already cold. As soon as that sun went over the mountains, it got cold. So I think we're gonna set the heater up tonight.
Well, I'm gonna be honest, the way people talk about the reward mine, I was expecting a little bit more than just this, but at least we're able to back in and get the Instagram shot. You know, that's the most important thing here. Maybe we can go inside. I'm just turning the truck around. I'm gonna shine the light bars down there and just see how far back it goes. Go on. <laughs> oh, you don't like caves, do you? It goes way back there. It goes, there's like a road and it goes around a corner. Trace is throwing stuff. <laughs> oh, this tunnel keeps on going. It's like just a road going into the mountain. It goes around a corner, so this is as far as the light bars make it. I brought my little flashlight and you can see it just keeps on going off into the darkness. There are tire tracks in here, so obviously people do drive in this far. I guess if you've got something that's not quite as tall as the tundra, or doesn't have that big antenna sticking out the roof, you can see where they were blasting the holes in the wall here, on the rock where they drilled in to blast. Well, I think that's plenty far enough. All right, you want to come in with me? Hell no. It goes, it goes on and on yeah, and on. Yeah, no, dude. I need someone to come with me. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a hole, right? It's just, it's like a road going into the mountain. We're just north of Bishop, California and back on the dirt roads. I don't think we're gonna bother airing down on this one because it's so well maintained. It's pretty smooth going. We've had to skip a few sections. Obviously we skipped Death Valley uh, because we're coming back here later in the year. But we did also have to skip a part that went over the mountains that you see behind me. There is a trail, I can't remember the name of it, something canyon trail. Uh, it goes right up over a peak that's about 10,800 feet. Uh, and then comes down the canyon there and the seasonal closures because of the snow so it's just not an option. We just found ourselves a fantastic place to camp, completely by accident. It's been a little bit of a short day, you know, we started late, about noon, went up to the mine, then basically drove along the highway to get, well, just over there, about 30 miles that way. And as we were driving along the trail, I looked left, saw this little road going out to the end here, and it's like, it, it, we've got a camp here. Like, this is the spot. 
you got views in every direction, just snow-capped mountains in every direction. And it's only about 4.30, but we figured it's worth it. We'll set up, we can do some work while we're here. It's great internet connection, great cell phone connection. So if we can work here, we'll cook dinner and have an early night. This looks like it might be the end of our trail. I'm not about to go digging through snow again, especially, well, first of all, alone, and also without a winch. We both had a feeling that this was coming, as the snow is getting deeper and deeper and coming up here, and we knew we were climbing an altitude. It's actually going across the top of the snow pretty good, but I still, I just don't want to risk it. It's not worth the risk. So we'll just backtrack. Getting out and looking at the snow, I think turning around was the right choice. It is very icy, so it actually supports the weight of the vehicle. I was able to drive up onto it, but it's just, you know, you hit that one slightly melted patch, you're gonna sink down into it and being alone, I don't wanna get stuck out here. Looking just over here, it's about a foot to a foot and a half deep here. And then obviously the trail continues climbing as well. So whoever turned around before us, I think they made the right choice and I think we made the right choice too. We're back on the Pacific Crest Trail and uh, last night we stayed out on that campsite at the end of the road with the fantastic views all the way around and we've come up here today to where we got stuck last time and you can see that things have changed, lots of things have changed. First of all, it's the end of May, there's no snow on the ground so we can make it through but uh, the more observant of you may notice a couple of things have changed with the truck. The truck that was once gray is now blue. On my way back west from my home in Kentucky, I stopped off at Adventure Motors in Kansas City. I told them I wanted the truck to stand out on video, but not have a color that's available for the Tundra from factory. This is what we decided on. It's Avery light blue, which is an almost perfect match to blue flame that's found on the Corolla and RAV4. While I was there, we also put the Adventure Motors suspension lift on. The preload collar I'd had before is okay for road use, but was harsh on washboards and sagged with the weight of my gear. The new setup rides perfectly, and I particularly like the Dobinson's MRRs it has in the rear. From there, it was back to CBI. Their full height bed rack was ready, which put the tent further forward where I wanted it. They had also developed skid plates, rock sliders, and their full width front bumper, which all gave me the protection I needed to use the truck comfortably off-road. In the front bumper, we put a full set of Heretic Studio lights, but more importantly, it also allowed me to fit some more serious recovery equipment. 
got a winch right on the front there on the CBI bumper. So if we do come across a couple of patches of snow, I have a little bit more confidence as long as there's some trees around to winch off. Uh, and it is likely that as we continue on this trip, we are gonna come across some snow, especially as we go further north into the mountains in Oregon and Washington. But we'll have to see how it goes. This time I had been joined by my wife, Elizabeth, who had recently started a new job that allowed her to work remotely. Things were looking good. She was excited to be back out on a trip. The weather was warm, the sun was shining, and we were surrounded by beautiful mountains. On our way, we passed the Mono Craters, the first of several volcanic formations we'd be seeing on this trip. These particular volcanoes have a history of explosive eruptions every 250 to 700 years, with the last one around 600 years ago. At the north end of the chain of volcanoes is Mono Lake. The most obvious volcanic formations are the limestone pillars, but the central island was formed from an eruption about 270 years ago. The lake also has no outflow, which created unique conditions that are perfect for the Mono Lake brine shrimp, which attract millions of birds every year. Next to me is the highway, and our original plan was to head up and across the mountains into Yosemite. I actually had tickets booked for tomorrow morning, but the road's closed. So we're not able to do that. I guess we'll just have to come back another year. Thankfully, there is plenty of other stuff to do around here. As we followed the Pacific Crest Trail up into Bodie Hills, we came across the Bodie Ghost Town. It was probably one of the coolest and most complete ghost towns I've ever visited, with a ton to see. There are 110 structures and most houses were in great condition and even had furniture and decorations. One reason for the condition could be the so-called Bodie Curse. It is said that people who steal souvenirs from the town suffer great misfortune, and the rangers are quick to tell you about the letters they receive with items to return. The writers often describe how their lives have been thrown into turmoil since the theft. As with most ghost towns, Bodie boomed in 1876 with the mining of valuable ores, in this case gold, in the Bodie Hills. Within three years, the population peaked with up to 10,000 people. The town had churches, hotels, general stores, and a newspaper. 
Although it was labelled as a ghost town just a few decades later in 1915, it wasn't until 1942, when the post office and last mine shut down, that the last permanent residents left. From the town, we were heading north, climbing over 9,000 feet in elevation. We'd been warned we might run into some snow. This is definitely deep enough and close enough to the edge that I don't want to try going around here, but I noticed there's a bypass that goes all the way around it. Looks like you probably need four wheel drive and high clearance, which explains the sign back at the ghost town, but I've got four wheel drive and high clearance. So we should be able to get past this one. It does put us right out on the next one, but looking on the drone, that one didn't look nearly as bad. So I think we're good. I think we can get through. The bypass was shown on the map as a four-wheel drive only road, and although it wasn't tough, it did get narrow in spots. Thankfully, we made it through with no problems, and were able to skip all of the snow. This is our campsite for tonight, and it's a good one, right on the edge of this beautiful reservoir with views off to the mountains in the distance. So a great little site, a little bit windy, but I think it'll be all right. So we're gonna set the tent up and get some dinner going. The following morning, I decided to test out my new geyser sponge bath system while Elizabeth worked. By noon, we were ready to head out. Coming down the hill there, we pulled over just to pull in the drone and we stopped at this like beautiful little grassy area here. It's like, it's like a garden where someone has set up this little campsite, beautifully trimmed grass, but it's just 
out here in nature. So we did mark this one for Patreon people. We're not gonna stay here, but when I was collecting the drone, I heard a hissing coming from one of our tires. Unfortunately, my back left tire is going flat quite quickly. So, I mean, this is a good spot to stop and change it. That's just a pain. <laughs> I hate changing tires. One of the things that makes it so difficult is that I like to keep my recovery gear on the roof easily accessible, but the tire kit, I mean, I very rarely have to change tires, so it's underneath everything. So I've got to pull all this stuff out. Well, this is it. There is a gash in the sidewall and uh, it appears as though this almost new tire is not going to be repairable. So I guess we need to see if we can find some 35 somewhere in stock. Somewhere around here so I can pick up another spare. Because uh, I don't like going without one. Well, it's a good thing I washed this morning. You know, just in time to get all dirty and sweaty again. Uh, but we're going to continue now. We're going to go over the mountains down to Carson City and I'll start calling around trying to find a tire. for tonight is actually at a campground uh, because I am in desperate need of some laundry. I've actually been on the road for about two and a half weeks. In that time we got the vehicle wrapped, the lift, all the bumpers and the armor, that kind of stuff done. So I've been going for a while and I have got to do laundry. So we're doing that tonight and we figured what better place to go to a campground than here at Lake Tahoe. That way we can camp right next to the beach there. We can wander down there and take a look around. So here we are. It's an expensive spot, but uh, like I say, gotta do it. Gotta do laundry. The next morning was spent in a nearby library working and editing. Rather than pay to camp another night, we drove north to find another campsite to work from. This morning we're waking up in Plumas National Forest. We're about an hour northwest of Reno. We've got to get packed up. It's going to take a little bit of time because we've got uh, our bug tent out because we were working this morning in that. And then we're going to continue heading kind of north, northwest-ish along the uh, Pacific Crest Trail. <laughs>
of the things I've noticed about the Pacific Crest Trail is it does follow a lot of paved roads and one of them was actually a paved road that goes all the way along the far side of the lake out there and I wanted to get up and get some views and I actually saw this fire tower as we were driving along the road so I opened up the Onyx app and saw that there's a trail all the way to the top here so I thought we'd come up and check out the view and uh, I think it was worth it. Great views around here. I walked up to the fire tower to check it out and I was invited in and shown around. Okay, basically, so this is an Osborne Firefinder. So if you do happen to spot a fire, what you do is you, this rotates the azimuth, and so you look through this slot right here, okay, and this is, there's a horse hair right there, and so you'll just basically line this up on your fire, okay, and then this gives you your bearing right here, okay, so I would call it in and say I've got a smoke report it's on bearing uh, 250 from this station and then you look at where it is in relation distance wise and you get on the topographical maps and you figure out well if it's the second peak over whatever you can look on this map right here and do that same thing and so you can pinpoint it somewhere it's going to be right on this line and so once you find the point there then you can say, okay, each one of these little lines, there's the station where we are, and so each one of these lines is a mile. So I can say, okay, it's on a bearing of whatever, and it's six miles out. Yeah. Okay, and then another station somewhere else will do exactly the same thing, and so then they can triangulate to send the troops. From the fire tower, we continued north, and after a short drive, we noticed the burned trees from last year's Dixie Fire. The fire was California's largest single fire, burning close to a million acres of forest and well over a thousand structures. When the blaze started, things were initially going well. Tankers had it contained, and a helicopter was able to use the nearby river to douse it with water. That is, until a drone showed up, grounding all aircraft. If you see a fire, keep your drone on the ground. It's possible that this enormous destruction could have been prevented if it wasn't for that one person. We made it to Lassen Volcanic National Park and basically the entire way we're driving through the burned forest from the Dixie Fire. And it's just incredible how much has been burned. Even up here, over two thirds of the park have been burned. And as a result, the road through the park is closed. We're just hiking up a little way just to see some of the views up here. And then we're gonna have to go around the whole park and try and find a place to camp. One of the issues we're having is I really don't want to camp in a burned area. You know, not only is it not very pretty, but you also run the risk of trees falling. Especially with, you know, it's a little bit windy today. So we're gonna hike around, look around, and then head out to camp. This seems like a good spot to camp, up here in the mountains, just next to a lake. Nice little lake here. Usually that means it's buggy as well, although so far it hasn't been too bad. I think there's just enough of a breeze to keep them away. We walk out here, it's like, I guess it's a mixture between a meadow and a lake. Thank you. 
what I said about the mosquitoes was a lie. They are bad. But I've got this, it goes over the hood, so they can't get in in here. In fact, the only thing they can get is my hand. Shortly after coming out onto paved roads, we passed a sign that said Subway Cave. Thinking that it sounded cool, we turned around to check it out. We were not disappointed. The cave is an enormous lava tube with smooth, rounded walls and perfectly flat floors. A lot like a subway. It's well worth a stop if you're in the area, but make sure you bring a flashlight. After a day on pavement, we finally make it to some unpaved roads and I come across this sign. So, I guess we're gonna go around and find another way. All right, we're back on the trail. This is the original road with the three ton bridge on it. And obviously the tundra is, I mean, it probably weighs three tons empty, completely dry and with all the stuff that I've added to it, it's way over three tons. I, I think, I don't know. I probably need to get it weighed. But uh, now that we're back on trail, we're gonna continue heading that way, which is north. Driving up this road, we keep seeing like little caves off to the side of the road, big holes in the ground, lots of lava flows, and then this one's signposted, so I figured we'd take a look. Unfortunately, the weather is, uh, I guess it's preparing us for the Pacific Northwest. We're very close to the Oregon border. It's just been kind of raining and drizzling all day. Well, that was cool. We're uh, heading back to the truck before we get soaked all the way through. But I really enjoy seeing, I um, mean, the cave was cool, but I love seeing the rocks where you can kind of see where they've been oozing. Uh, and I think we're going to see more of it because we're quite close to Lava Beds National Monument. I think we're going to end up camping somewhere up there. Back on the road, we started passing patches of snow. The higher we climbed, the bigger the patches got until we came across an enormous section with no end in sight. Well, we didn't make it quite as far as I thought we would before we hit impassable snow. So the trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, continues along that road and there's just thick, wet snow that way. And I'm not going to drive through it, especially since the trail climbs several hundred feet more over the hill before heading over uh, down into the uh, lava flows. Uh, instead, we're going to try this road. Uh, it looks as though a lot of the tire tracks go this way and this is signposted as going towards Highway 24 and it looks as though it goes downhill on the map. So we'll try this way. If this doesn't work out, it is a long way to backtrack. So <laughs> I really hope it does. There were a few deeper patches of snow, but going downhill helped me get through them easily. I 
couple of miles in, I rounded a corner to find two vehicles stuck in a particularly deep drift. The small jeep had tried to make it through, not wanting to turn around and backtrack, and had buried itself. Shortly after, the Ford had come across them and tried to get close enough to pull them out with a short chain. The jeep came out easily, but the heavy truck took a lot more effort. Is that us moving? Yeah, we're moving. As we were packing up, it started to hail, making things even more unpleasant. I wasn't dressed for the weather. I had boots and waterproof pants in the truck, but in my hurry to help out, I hadn't put them on. Reflecting back on it now, I should have taken a couple of minutes to keep myself dry. Clothes can take a really long time to dry while you're out camping. The snow was wet and slick, but I made it through and waited for them on the other side. Well, it's a good thing we chose to come this way because we came across a couple of guys just completely stuck in the snow here. Apparently they've been here for two hours before we came down. They said going back that way is the easy way to go, but I had to winch them through before they could go back down. So I'm going to hang around and they're going to follow me out. Uh, I made it through on the way down, but it's looking as though uh, the little jeep just got stuck. So we may be winching again. But we all made it out. <laughs> that was... Uh, that added to the adventure for sure. It <laughs> soaked through to the skin. You know, it's been raining heavily, a little bit of hail, but all three of us are through now and we're heading back down. They've told me there are a couple more patches as we go, but nothing bad. So I just said I'd follow them that way if anything does happen, the three of us are sticking together. We can get them out. Uh, but uh, <laughs> now we need to find somewhere to camp. Like I say, I've soaked through. I am very tempted to just see if I can find a campground with some laundry and just put all my stuff through the dryer. Well, this will do nicely. It couldn't have come at a better time. Basically, as soon as we left the National Forest, the rain stopped, the sun came out, and there was this campground off to the right-hand side of the road. So we stopped. It was $20. Basically you get a field here, but it means we can set up everything in the sun. I can get the inside of the vehicle soaked from where I was leaning out the window while winching. My jackets are soaked. I need to get changed and uh, they have a dryer as well just over the road. So I can go put everything in there to dry and uh, kind of reset ready for tomorrow. We woke up refreshed and dry the next morning, ready to explore the lava beds. So we've just left camp and we're driving on the road out to Lava Beds National Monument and I saw a thing labeled Mammoth Cave on the map and I thought, yes, this is my chance to get a sweet drone shot of a cave. Obviously yesterday it was raining so I couldn't get that cave and later we'll be in the National Monument so we won't be able to do fly any drones there. Uh, so we pulled off the side of the road here, getting ready to get this sweet video of the cave and uh, well this is Mammoth Cave so uh, I guess it's not really worth getting the drone out for it. Well it looks like it actually goes back a decent distance but uh, again drone is not gonna work and I'm not going in there. A short distance further we entered the National Monument which was much less disappointing. There are over 800 caves and lava tubes in the area with up to 24 of them open for you to explore. The caves have different lengths and difficulty ratings, and we started with the only cave in the monument that has a paved path or lighting, the 770 foot long Mushpot Cave. The second cave we visited was the Sentinel Cave, which at 3,280 feet long is the longest easy rated cave in the monument. This one is unpaved and unlit, but with much larger caverns and a loop hike that is well worth visiting. All of the caves in the park were formed from ancient lava flows between 10,000 and 65,000 years ago. As lava flowed along a stream, it cooled on the surface, creating a protective shell. Inside, the lava level would eventually drop, hollowing out the tube. As you explore, you can see where it has run down the walls, leaving behind flowing rock formations. 
Well, now we have to pick up the Pacific Crest Trail again, and really the only place to pick it up is right next to Crater Lake. So we're just gonna head straight up there uh, and see Crater Lake today. There's supposed to be about eight inches of snow there tonight, so we figured today's gonna be the day to go see it. I completely forgot that in Oregon you don't pump your own gas, but it is so much cheaper here. We saw it for $7.39 in California, and it is $4.89 here, so we've been, uh, I'm down to some fumes now trying to get back into Oregon before filling up. The drive up to Crater Lake was like entering a winter wonderland, with beautiful snow-covered trees and deep drifts on either side of the road. As we climbed, we entered the clouds, and by the time we reached the visitor center at the summit, the visibility was terrible. Thankfully, as we approached the viewpoint, there was a break in the clouds, allowing us to see the other side of the lake. At almost 2,000 feet deep, Crater Lake is the deepest lake in the US. It sits inside a volcanic caldera that was formed in a massive eruption just under 8,000 years ago. It's one of those places I wanted to visit for a very long time, and while I wasn't disappointed by the view, I really want to go back when the sun is out. We really struggled to find a place to camp tonight, and that's because we passed up hundreds of great spots up in the National Forest to come down here to about 10 miles outside of Medford, Oregon, uh, because I wanted to have cell phone service for tonight. I want to start planning out the next leg of our trip. Basically, the part that we're on, on the Pacific Crest Trail, is just too high altitude. We're here too early in the year, and the result is there's just too much snow for us to make it through. So we're going to head over to the coast and start heading up the coast of Oregon for the next couple of days. So what that meant is we ended up coming out to some BLM land trying to find a spot to camp and unfortunately it's closed to motorized vehicles so we have just pulled up in a parking lot at the end of the road. So not very glamorous but it'll do the job and it allows me to start planning. Another good thing about coming down here is it's in the upper 30s and dry instead of in the low 20s and snowing up in the mountains. That evening, I sat in the tent and created a route for us using information from the Onyx app and my benchmark atlas. And we are back off road. We're in the uh, Siskiyou National Forest. Um, I probably shouldn't have even bothered trying to pronounce it. I should have just said we're in a national forest. We're in the national forest. There you go, cut, cut the rest of that. We'll go with that. Um, and so we're just airing down. I don't really know what this trail is like. Uh, on Onyx it's just shown as a green road. Um, on my Atlas it's just a dotted road that shows that it is unpaved. But we're airing down because it, it's been a little washboardy for the last couple of miles and I was at highway pressure so I'll just make it a little more comfortable. And if it ends up getting rougher later on then I'm already prepared. So like I say I don't really know what this trail is like. We're just gonna head up into the mountains and hopefully it's pretty. Uh, the goal is to get to a campsite that I know just off the coastline by the end of the day today. The route ended up being a mixture of well-maintained gravel roads and slightly neglected dirt roads that twisted its way through Oregon's Klamath Mountains with beautiful views around every turn and along each ridgeline.
so far this route has worked out really really well we've had some great roads actually pretty well maintained for the most part going through the mountaintops which is exactly what i wanted because that's where you get the views and the great drone shots we did just come to this sign uh, it says travel not advised through may 31st today's the 30th so uh i think we'll be all right we'll go check it out despite a few patches of lingering snow the road itself was clear and paved all the way through I had planned to leave it to go back into the mountains, but time was short and we had to get back to cell service that evening for my wife Elizabeth to work the next day. As we dropped out of the mountains, we ended up following the Rogue River out to the coast. From the beach, it was back up into the mountains to head to camp. Tonight's campsite more than makes up for last night's campsite. Just look at the views out across the Pacific. I actually had this one recommended to me by Justin. It looks though like other people have camped up here. There's a little firing just over there. But I'm really looking forward to seeing the sunset. And uh, apparently tomorrow morning, if the clouds roll in off the Pacific, it looks really cool. So I have to set up some time lapses for that too. I'm also surprised at how little wind there is up here uh you know down on the beach really really windy really cold and there's just just the slightest breath of wind up here so i, I think this is going to be a good little campsite i'm looking forward to uh, seeing it in the morning Unfortunately, the time lapse last night didn't work out. According to the app I have, the Milky Way would have been like right over here, heading across over the ocean, just as the sun rose. But when I woke up at 1 a.m. to set it up, it was so damp out here, like there was condensation over everything. I just wasn't comfortable leaving my camera out overnight in those conditions. So obviously I need to pick up like a little rain jacket for it or something so I can do that in the future because I think it would have been a really cool time lapse. Still, this is a great spot. You know, it's really calm. There's not a breath of wind here. It's just got birds singing in the trees around this. And of course, we're so far out of the way that no one else has come up here at all. And I doubt anyone will while we're up here. Uh, and there's great cell phone service too. So uh, Elizabeth's got some meetings she's attending. She's got some work she needs to get done, uh, which means I can just sit up in the tent and edit some videos this morning. So it'll be a late start before we head down to the uh, coastal highway and head north along the coast. We just stopped off in Port Orford and had a fantastic lunch at a little place called The Dive and uh, we decided we'd walk it off 
by coming out onto the beach and it's a little windy, but it is a beautiful place out here. We continued up the 101 along the coastline, stopping to see the noisy sea lions at Shore Acres State Park. And the lighthouse at Newport before finally heading inland again. We are back in central Oregon again. And uh, we're actually staying at a campground tonight, and we're staying at this campground because of this. It is a natural hot spring here. This one's actually way too hot for us to get into. It's about 200 degrees, so I think like the hot spring in Dante's Peak. You wouldn't want to get in that. But they pipe it out of here and across to a pool up by where we're camping. So we're going to go set up our tent and enjoy a nice hot soak. We were back on the Pacific Crest Trail, this time at a much lower 3,000 feet. We'd assumed that the lower elevation meant we could avoid some of the snow that we'd run into on the higher roads to the south. We were wrong. Well, we ran into what I consider to be impassable snow a lot sooner than I thought we would. On the outside of the corner, uh, it's about thigh deep by the looks of things, and then on the inside, a little, little shallower, but it leans off towards the creek to the point where I'm not even going to bother attempting it, especially considering this trail climbs another 600 feet. Honestly, I didn't think we'd be running into much snow on this. I thought maybe right at the top would hit a couple of patches. Obviously, I was wrong. So we're going to have to reevaluate. Um, our goal for today was to make it up to Mount Hood. So uh, really the only way to get there now is to head back down out the east side of the mountains towards Bend. And uh, I'm going to check the maps and see if I can find some more trails that we can take. We backtracked and made our way east over Santium Pass to a route that I had put together on the fly. The new route was only a few hundred feet lower in elevation than the spot we turned around at, but being in the rain shadow of the Cascades meant that we didn't run into any problems. This is Mount Hood, or at least it's a few hundred feet of it before it disappears up into the rain and the clouds. Um, so obviously the view here is a little bit disappointing. I think we're here wrong time of year, wrong day, something like that. Although one of the cool things is you can visit the Overlook Hotel up here, or the Timberline Lodge as I think they call it in real life. But you know, it's the one from The Shining. Thank you. 
Back at the coast, we headed out onto Gearheart Beach. At the northern end of the beach is the wreck of the Peter Iredale. On the night of September 26, 1906, the ship was making its way up the coast from Mexico when it was forced ashore by strong westerly winds from a squall. When she ran into the beach, it was with so much force that three of the four masts broke instantly. Thankfully, none of the crew were seriously injured and everyone was rescued. Today, you can see a small portion of the bow and hull structure but not much else, as it's slowly rusting away. We're gonna let the cameras dry off a little bit as we head inland, and then we're gonna cross into Washington. And what I'm hoping is we can get ahead of the rain a little bit. I was just looking at the radar, and it looks as though it's clear in the area I wanna go, because there are some viewpoints I wanna check out, and I wanna see a little more than I did at Mount Hood. It's a little better than Mount Hood, I guess. It is the base of Mount St. Helens. You can't see much of it. The uh, the sun has come through a little bit since I've been here. I've been waiting a while, but uh, I think this is as good as it's going to get. And I've wanted to see Mount St. Helens for the longest time, and uh, I still want to see Mount St. Helens. And the weather, unfortunately, is supposed to continue like this for the next couple of days. So I think what we're going to do is head into Seattle. And uh, I've been promising Elizabeth an Airbnb at some point, uh, and I planned on doing it at the end of this trip, but uh, she's been struggling. If you haven't noticed, she's about seven months pregnant. So uh, she's struggling getting in and out of the tent. She's tired, uh, doesn't like being in the car constantly. She's been a trooper on this trip. She has not complained, but uh, we'll do that. That way we can do some touristy stuff for a couple of days and then we can get back out on the trail and hopefully the rain's gone. So uh, I'll see you in a couple of days. The Airbnb gave us a chance to spend a couple of days drying off, relaxing and doing laundry. It was also close enough to Olympic National Park that they were able to take the time to go up and visit. The park itself is huge, so it took an entire day just to drive around it seeing the sights. The variety from the Alpine mountains, beautiful lakes, lush green rainforest and the rocky beaches means it's probably worth spending several days in the area. While we were there, Elizabeth also wanted to visit Forks. If you know, you know. Would you look at that? There's no clouds, no rain. We're still in Washington. We're Mount Rainier National Park and uh, we can actually see today. That's a nice change. The park is surrounded by beautiful mountains, valleys, rivers, and waterfalls. But obviously, the main attraction is the 14,410-foot volcano, Mount Rainier. At almost twice the size of Mount St. Helens, it is considered one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world, due not only to the potential size of the eruption, but also the large number of glaciers on the peak that could cause huge mud and ash flows, known as lahars, in every direction. Over 150,000 people live on old lahar deposits. And of course, as is absolutely typical for this trip, the road's closed through the park. So instead of going about 10 miles that way to rejoin the Pacific Crest Trail, we now have to backtrack all the way west around the park, probably, well, we can go north or we can go south around the mountains, and it adds like 60 to 80 miles to our trip and several hours. So by the time we get back onto the trail, it's gonna be time to find camp. And then we've gotta find somewhere with a cell service because Elizabeth's got to work in the morning. So really inconvenient and really annoying. <laughs> Great. Just, I think, tip here, the pro tip, don't do this in, well, it's June now. Do this later in the year. The enormous detour put us hours behind and way off course. Still several hours from the place I wanted to camp that night, 
we pulled off I-90 and found a different spot in the Mount Baker National Forest. We've made it back to the Pacific Crest Overland Route, and things are very different over this side of the mountain range. Uh, you know, before, very heavily forested. Here, it's a lot more open. You can actually see the hills, see the rolling hills around us. So uh, I guess uh, it's gonna be a lot easier flying the drone over here if the rain quits. It's just very gentle sprinkling at the moment, uh, but still probably a little too much to fly the drone. So let's get going and uh, hope that it clears up. As we reached paved roads again, we turned west through the Cascades National Park. The drive was beautiful, if a little wet, but we didn't stop long to see the sights. We had a border to cross, and we had to cross it before midnight. We are in Canada, specifically I'm here in beautiful British Columbia, just outside of Vancouver. Um, that's too big. It's too big for the trails? Yep. Oh, okay. Also, why are you camped in my driveway? I had convinced Sean from the story till now to take me and Elizabeth for a trip in the beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Our goal was a disused fire tower at the top of a nearby mountain. I'd be in my large tundra and Sean would be driving his Bronco. We knew the trails would be rough and bumpy, so we aired our tires down. We also knew there would probably be snow but we were not prepared for how much work it would be, or how close to the edge we'd get. On your left, bear cup right here. Hey, little baby bear. Thank you. 
One thing we are finding is that the uh, trail is a little bit tight for the tundra, especially with some of these fallen trees. Thankfully, Sean's in the lead, and of course he brought a chainsaw with him. So he's trimming it so that we'll fit through. As we had climbed, we had passed bigger and bigger patches of snow before reaching a large drift that we had to scout out. Crossing it, we found it to be really slippery. I fell pretty hard. Yeah, I can see where you went down. At first I was thinking like, drive through here, but yeah. then if I slide into here, it's, it's gonna be suck, tough. Right? The first attempt, taking the safer high road, didn't work out. So Sean followed the riskier line along the edge of the snowdrift. Things started out well, but about halfway across, the back tires started sliding towards the edge. We may have to do a little shoveling to get through here. So things didn't go exactly as planned going through the snow. It started off well. Yeah, this was planned. I don't know. It doesn't look great from where I'm standing, but um, I've got the world's smallest shovel, so I've grabbed that. We're going to dig it out up front a little bit and try Max Trex because uh, we think that's the best option from here. Is Let's that get your shovel? This is my shovel. Oh my goodness. It's so small. Hey, it's not the size. <laughs> is that how you use it? Yeah. We got to work, shoveling out snow in front of the tires on either side of the Bronco using the world's smallest shovel and a couple of traction boards. In the end, all that work gained very little, and the Bronco was hanging off the edge even further. So we went back to shoveling and tried again, this time being very careful with the placement of the traction boards. We are almost there. We spent a few more minutes shoveling and made another attempt. dug in here and I think you just started to pivot on your front tire there. Well, it might be worth having a traction board on either side yeah. so that you can get up a bit higher. And then if you slide down, you'll slide down into the track at least, right? Yeah. Let's try that. On my attempt, I was able to follow Sean's tracks, making things a lot easier. Right up until I got past the traction boards. It was back to digging, but this time, with Sean's Bronco in front, I had an idea. Things didn't quite go as planned coming up here. The back end has started to slip down. Uh, so I think what we're gonna do is hook the winch up to the back of Sean's truck up there. And that way I'm gonna use like a combination of me pulling and driving a little bit. So hopefully without spinning the tires, it doesn't cause me to slip down anymore. Plus we've got a couple of traction boards down. So uh, go ahead and pull it out. The winch really helped, and with one last shuffle of the traction boards, I was pretty much out. We had hit another patch of deep snow, and this time, rather than crawl our way across, we had decided to try brute force, and it hadn't worked out well. Sean was stuck, so much so that the winch was pulling the heavy tundra forward instead of him backwards, 
even with a couple of logs as wheel chocks. We only managed to get him out after strapping the back of the tundra to the tree behind us. I wonder if I'd air down a little more if I could crawl it. So he aired down to just under 10 psi and tried again, this time taking it slowly and carefully, avoiding the ruts he'd just left. Pressure always wins in the snow. Then it was our turn. I suggested Elizabeth tried the new crawl control on the tundra, and I think that's why we didn't make it. Stop, 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 stop. We tried running the winch to the back of the Bronco, but in an attempt to stop from pulling it backwards, slipped into the big holes he'd left earlier. We'd need to back out with the help of the traction boards. Uh, I try wiggling the wheels as you go. The front wheel, obviously the front wheel. You can't wiggle the back wheels. Try like, like really turning the position. Yes. That moved you. There you go. Nice. Alright, I'm going to try this one more time. This time we have air down to a little under 10 psi, which should help with getting traction over the snow. We're going to reshuffle and try and go a little further over into some fresh snow. And we've got some traction boards down. It'll stop us from falling into the holes that Sean dug out earlier when he tried some brute force to get through. So hopefully this is it. If we don't make it through this time, I think we're just going to set up camp here on the end. And there is actually a firing there, but it's all covered in snow. and not very nice. Nice and slow. Coming onto the boards. Good, keep going. Yeah. Slow driver. Yeah, you're good. More driver. What an incredible spot to stop and camp. Uh, I, I think it was worth all the effort that we put into going through all that snow. I just can't stop looking around. I want to fly my drone more. I want to do like five time lapses. It's incredible. It is very cold, but apparently the fire tower here is open. So I'm hoping that we can cook dinner in here rather than out in the wind. It's toasty in here. It is. It's just the wind chill out there. You got a guest book. You can look and see if there's any fires. Yeah. I don't see any. I just see some, some nice looking rigs out there. That's about it. Yeah. I think we set the stove on here. Yeah. Cook some dinner.
Last night ended up being kind of windy up here and really cold. <laughs> I had to get up in the night. It was freezing. It was still a really cool place to camp, you know, waking up with these views all the way around. Actually, the sun was rising one of the times I got up, and it was really cool. Um, if you want to come up here yourself, this track to come up to Cornwall Fire Tower is actually on Onyx Off-Road. But now we've got to get packed up, and we're uh, going to head back down the mountain, fight our way back through those snow drifts, and uh, I think tonight's camp is going to be a little bit lower, should be a lot more sheltered. We made it down off the trail to the fire tower, the fire lookout, and so far the tundra has not been too big. Now it was a little bit tight going through a couple of spots, I ended up scraping the wrap with some branches. Uh, it's held up just fine, but the bronco just went straight through. But now we're going to go, well first of all we're going to air up a little bit, because uh, we're at like 8 to 10 psi and it's just a little bit low for the roads that we're going to be on for uh, the next little while. Uh, but apparently the next trail gets a little tighter, so the tundra might still be too big. the road that way mm -hmm. there's another way out to the out to the highway okay and there's also some some roads that can be explored and stuff but they lock the gate now and don't let people pass here so That's we came here last year but yeah The trail we had found led over the mountain and eventually back down to the highway. From there, we went south, back up into the mountains, heading for camp. Just before we reached the campsite for the night, things started to get more overgrown and a lot narrower. Just 
gonna set up a camp. We're overlooking the lake here. Weather is wonderful, bugs mild, and Sean's setting up something I'm pretty excited to see. It is Starlink. Is it Starlink RV? It's exactly the same, same thing. thing. Yeah, just you pay a little more. Yeah, I mean, I just enabled the roaming on it. That's all I did. Yeah, that's something we actually just ordered ours so that we can work while we're out traveling. Uh, it arrived uh, about a week ago, but unfortunately it's a home and we're obviously out here, so it's not much good to us, but I'm looking forward to seeing how well it does. So he just walked down the slope and set up the, the satellite receiver down there, so it's got a clear view of the sky, even though we're under the trees. Here it goes. Later that evening, Teddy from Unwinding Roads and Mike from the Unexpected Off-Road showed up to join us at camp. They brought with them something for me to try. You gotta put your Canadian hat on. Put my hat on. You can't have a, a Canadian... So, am I allowed to put it on before I try this? Yeah, you have to put it on before you, oh, okay. you have the cocktail. You gotta tell me what's in this first. Okay. Or do I have to... Wait, read the instru instructions? I'm gonna hold it. <laughs> read the instructions? You mean yeah. the ingredients? Yeah, that's all I was looking for. <laughs> okay, so it's... It's Water. tomato juice, which is clam juice and tomato juice mixed together. And then Worcester sauce, black pepper... Hold on, hold and on, can we rewind a bit? Okay. The tomato and... Clam. Clam? Clam juice, like from... Like a clam, that's why it's called clamato, clam and tomato, right? That's disgusting. <laughs> that sounds no, you're disgusting. wrong. <laughs> you're wrong, you're insulting my culture. Sorry. What a weird combination of things. And this is normal here in Canada? This is my favorite drink. A toast to Rob coming to Canada. Cheers. 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 It's pretty good, isn't it? It's not 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 horrible. That's what I like to hear. Not That's what we like to hear. It's not horrible. <laughs> it's not horrible. It's, All right, let's sing the Canadian national anthem. <laughs> it's whatever the liquid version of edible is. Drinkable? Drinkable. That's Drinkable. All. <laughs> it's drinkable. I'm struggling with words tonight. <laughs> Without anyone noticing, I quietly put it down on the tailgate and started dinner. We spent the rest of the evening chatting and staying warm around the fire. On our last morning, we packed up, said goodbye to new friends, and headed back down the trail. Well, that is it for our weekend. We're just airing up. We've got about four and a half hours back to the US border got across tonight to make it to our next event but it has been a fantastic weekend thank you so much to sean for showing us around make sure you go check out his channel subscribe to that if you're not already and if you're not subscribed to my channel i'd really appreciate a subscription about 11 12 percent of viewers are actually subscribed and i really want to make it to 100,000 subscribers so click that subscribe button and then to answer the question about the truck is it too big i don't think so what do you think i don't think so yeah we obviously Sean picked trails that specifically fit the truck, so uh, it, it was still a little bit tight. There are trails out there that are going to be too small for it, but you just don't do those trails. There's going to be trails too small for the Bronco. You could do trails that are too small for an ATV that only a dirt bike would fit, fit on, but uh, you know, it's a great truck. Uh, it did the job this weekend. It's also very blue. It is very blue. <laughs> well, thanks for watching. Make sure you like the video and subscribe.